For the past year and a half, we've seen a pattern from the Biden administration of nominating ideological zealots to our courts. A moment ago, Ms. Abudu, in answering questions from Senator Lee, you said you understood the difference between an advocate and a judge. Well, I'm sure you do. You've never served as a judge. You've spent your entire life as an advocate. And as an advocate on the extreme left, there has been a pattern of nominee after nominee that have been extreme zealots, but I have to say your nomination, when I look at your record, I find deeply concerning. The last three years you've served at the Southern Poverty Law Center. The Southern Poverty Law Center is a hateful and extreme place. And their hate, among other things, has led to horrific violence. I'm speaking in particular about the 2012 shooting at the Family Research Council here in Washington. There a gunman sought to make a political statement by shooting as many members of the Family Research Council as possible, and he sought to smear their faces with Chick-fil-A sandwiches after he murdered them. He was only stopped due to the heroic efforts of the Family Research Council employee, Leo Johnson, whose courage saved many lives that day. The evidence in the case indicated that the shooter had assembled his targets by visiting the Southern Poverty Law Center website of so-called hate groups, where the Southern Poverty Law Center equated the Family Research Council with true bigoted hate groups like the KKK and the Nazi Party. Do you agree with your employer that the Family Research Council is equivalent to the KKK or the Nazi Party? Senator Cruz, I would first respectfully state that although, yes, I have spent a big chunk of my career as a civil rights lawyer, I, early on in my career, I was actually a staff attorney with the 11th Circuit. So I started my career and my understanding of the legal profession from the position of being and representing the court to some extent and making okay, But being sure a staff attorney is not a, not a judge. So could you answer the question, please? The que well, in terms of the... Do you agree with your employer that the Family Research Council is comparable to the Ku Klux Klan or the Nazi Party? Senator, as I shared with your colleagues earlier, I can't comment to that. I'm in the legal department. Well, why can't you? I'm asking if you agree with them. You work for them. That's what they say. Their hateful rhetoric led to an attempted murder. Do you agree with them? You went to work for them knowing that their hate had led to this violence. Do you agree with that or not? I went to work for the SPLC to help lead its voting rights practice group, and that do, is Do you work. agree with your employer? Senator, again, I can't, I So you're going to refuse familiar. to answer that? Senator, again, I can't speak to work that I did not do. You, you can say whether you agree with it or not, correct? I cannot speak to work, Senator Cruz, that I did not do. Do you agree with the statement, the Family Research Council is equivalent to the Ku Klux Klan or the Nazi Party, yes or no? I cannot speak to a statement where I played no role in the research or the writing or the publication because I did not, Senator Cruz, respectfully. I didn't ask if you did it. You went to work for them. Do you, do you agree with them? Right, you're, you're refusing to answer that. Uh, let's, let's move on. What is a white supremacist? Senator, my general understanding is that a white supremacist is someone who hates people simply based on the color of their skin. Okay, your current employer has labeled three members of this committee, myself, Senator Hawley, and Senator Blackburn, as white supremacists. Do you agree with that characterization? Senator, I have never referred to you or any member of this committee. Has the Southern Poverty, Poverty Law Center done so? I'm not familiar with the exhaustive list of policymakers that might have been researched and profiled by another department within the organization that How I How many members of the United States Senate do you believe are white supremacists? Senator, again, sitting here before you, I would not call any single member of Congress. But you're proud way. to work for an organization that does. 
I'm proud to do voting rights work on behalf of an organization that provides pro bono counsel to individuals, especially low income individuals. So let me ask South. you, how could, how could anyone who is not on the radical left, how could someone who's pro-life, how could someone who's conservative, how can someone who's religious have any degree of confidence if they were to appear in a court with you as a judge, you've spent a lifetime working for groups that smear half this country as white supremacists and Klansmen. That is offensive. My dad came as an immigrant to this country from Cuba with nothing. That is hateful language. How could any litigant Expect to get a fair shot if you were a judge, given your advocacy and history of extreme advocacy. Because, Senator Cruz, my father came to this country with nothing in his pocket as well. But why don't you give that grace to others? I do, Senator. That's what my religious freedom, my free speech work, my voting rights work, my criminal justice work, Senator Cruz, all of that work that I've done represents my commitment to making sure that all people at least have equal access to justice and equal justice under law. Thank you. Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations to the nominees and thanks for being here. Ms. Abudu, if I could just start with you. You said to Senator Ossoff just a couple of minutes ago that you believe in the First Amendment, right? Absolutely. And you, you told him that you have litigated cases under the various clauses of the First Amendment, and you said that you think that free, free speech is essential. Is that right? That is correct. And freedom of thought is essential, you also said. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, what about the right to counsel? Is that also essential? The Sixth Amendment and the Supreme Court have said so. So what would you think about your organization calling other members of the bar, saying that it is their goal, your organization's goal, to destroy other members of the bar who provide litigation, who provide counsel to indigent defendants. I'm thinking particularly of the Alliance Defending Freedom. Back in 2007, a senior fellow at your organization said in a speech that, I want to say plainly, our aim in life is to destroy these groups, referring to the Alliance Defending Freedom and others. Just to be clear, these are groups that provide representation to, to indigent defendants and to other defendants. Uh, other uh, plaintiffs, counsel, uh, litigants. I want to say plainly that our aim in life is to destroy these groups, to completely destroy them. To completely destroy them. Do you think that's appropriate rhetoric for someone to use about opposing counsel or a member of the bar? Do you think that's an appropriate goal to have? Senator, I would first say that I'm not familiar even with the language that you just cited, but I will say that my work again, and I stand on my record, is to ensure that all people have access to counsel to vindicate their rights. Do you think that this is appropriate rhetoric from a senior fellow at your organization? Senator, again, not having that language in front of me, not understanding the context, I can't even respond to that. Oh, you can't say it's inappropriate? without more information, without really? context, and without seeing it. That's interesting. Now, you said to this committee repeatedly that all you do at uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center is voting rights. That's not what you said in your questionnaire to the committee, though. You said that you oversee litigation related to hate groups. So let's talk a little bit more about hate groups, which apparently you oversee the litigation for. Is it your position that organizations like the Alliance Defending Freedom are a hate group? Senator, I would want to review that language because in which terms I'm sorry, which language? Regarding the overseeing the organization's research and profiling of hate groups. I don't work in that part of the Let me just quote for you. Further, as the director for strategic litigation, I've taken on significant managerial responsibilities, including overseeing all of the organization's legal programmatic work, which in addition legal programmatic work, which in addition to voting rights, includes immigrants' rights criminal justice reform, children's rights, LGBTQ rights, and litigation related to hate groups. Thank you for clarifying that it was our legal program. Right. And in terms of the cases that the organization has brought, it does include representing individuals who have been targeted on the internet 
who have been harassed, whose family has been stalked in terms of, or because of their identity, in the one particular case because our, of our client's identity as a member of the Jewish community. And we represented that woman successfully. Yeah, but you say you oversee litigation related to hate groups. Your organization is infamous for designating anyone who disagrees with it as a hate group, trying to drive them from public life, and in the words of, of your own employees, trying to completely destroy them. Is that a record that you're proud of? I am proud of our representation of that woman in that case who simply because of her Jewish heritage was targeted and stalked. That's and not what harassed. we're talking about. Let, let, me, let, me ask you, let me ask you about the Southern Poverty Law Center more generally. What year did you join SPLC? February 2021. Or, I'm sorry, 2019. 2019. 2019 was the year that the SPLC paid $3.4 million in response to defamation lawsuits. 2019 was the year that Charity Watch gave your organization an F rating. The SPLC has been labeled by the left-wing policy journal Current Affairs as an outright fraud that uses willful deception designed to scare liberals into writing checks. The progressive journalist Alexander Cockburn said this about SPLC, I regard it, the Southern Poverty Law Center, collectively as one of the greatest frauds in American life. Liberal death penalty abolitionist Stephen Bright refused to accept an award named after the founder of the SPLC, saying in his words, the SPLC has long been run by a con man and a fraud. That's from a Harper's Magazine article. Also in 2019, SBLC employees told the press, we were part of a con and we knew it. That's in a New Yorker article, not exactly a right-wing journal. Are you concerned by any of this record of the organization that you work for? Senator, what I'm glad that I didn't hear in that litany is a complaint about the voting rights work that we've done, about the clients and the community. Are you concerned that Charity Watch gave you an F, that you had to pay $3.4 million in response to defamation lawsuits, that you've been criticized, your organization's been criticized as a fraud and a con job, and that you work for an organization who says it's their goal in life to completely destroy their opponents? None of that gives you any pause. Senator, again... My work with the Southern Poverty Law Center has been to uphold the constitutional rights of individuals who without pro bono counsel would not be able, even able to have access to justice. I have to tell you, I find your answers absolutely extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. I can't believe you've been nominated for this position. I can't believe that the President of the United States would nominate someone from this organization with this record. And I can't believe that you would sit here today and refuse to condemn this hateful, frankly, violent rhetoric from this organization with this record. It's astounding to me. Thank you very much. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Judge, Ms. Abudu, uh, congratulations. I'm, I'm going to just talk to you, uh, at least initially, a little bit about the law. Um, Ms. Abudu, what, what is the, uh, what's the adequate and independent state grounds doctrine? Thank you, Senator Kennedy. You're welcome. It, in my practice, I actually haven't had an opportunity to use that principle or doctrine, but my general understanding is that it speaks to the fact that if a federal court is able to resolve an issue based on state law grounds, then that is what should lead in terms of the court's ultimate decision. Okay. What is the uh, selective incorporation doctrine? That also, in the voting rights or civil rights context, is a term that I haven't had to come across. But what I do know is that as a legal research and writer, mm -hmm. and for sure confronting possibly new areas of law, I look very forward to doing my due diligence in terms of making sure I'm familiar with doctrines such as that one. Do you know what it is? So, no, I'm not familiar with it Select sitting here today. Incorporation with you. Doctrine. Okay. You're going to see a lot of it if you're confirmed on the 11th Circuit. Um, can Congress pay, pass any law that the Constitution doesn't prohibit? Based on the frame of your question, I would say yes, that sounds right. So you think Congress has plenary power? Well, I would first look to what the Supreme Court has said in terms of following precedent. No, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested, if I could, uh, Counselor, in your opinion. Is, is the United, does the United States Congress have delegated powers or plenary power? 
Well, the Congress has both, I would say, from my general understanding. Again, it depends on the context and the issue, okay. but it is. Can you explain the difference to me between strict scrutiny and intermediate scrutiny? Senator, strict scrutiny is the highest level of scrutiny that's often applied in constitutional right. cases. What's it the, requires. What's the definition? I'm sorry, go ahead. Excuse me. So it right. requires that a state, when enacting a law or regulation, have a compelling governmental right. interest for doing so and that the law is narrowly tailored to achieve that interest. Okay. And then. Intermediate, did you say? Yeah. That? Okay, yeah. so intermediate yeah. speaks to the issue of having a substantial interest or uh, that is, or an important governmental interest that is substantially related. Okay. Um, do you believe that the meaning of the Constitution is immutable or does it change over time? Senator, I would say that the Supreme Court in some cases has analyzed that issue and the response really does depend on the context and the issue. But what the court does or has done in its approach, of course, is look to the plain meaning of, the, of a statute or of the Constitution because that really is where the inquiry should start. And if the language is plain, then that is where the inquiry can end. Okay, thank you for that. You uh, you were involved in a 2021 report from the um, Southern Poverty Law Center about voting in Louisiana. Um, did you say, quote, racist white Southerners close quote, and quote, hostile white voters and governmental officials in Louisiana continue to make local polling places and early voting locations threatening spaces for black voters. Did you say that? Senator, I do not believe that I said that. I haven't read that publication in some time. Will you help time. write it? I helped to draft the publication and approved it, but I'm not familiar with that language. Oh, you don't? Okay. Uh, in that same report, did you say, well, t tell, tell me where in Louisiana uh, lo local polling places and early voting locations are threatening African American voters? You said it, so which polling places? So again, Senator, obviously I don't have that report in front of me to be able to read and remind myself of uh, the examples that might have been shared. But what I can say is that Louisiana- well, let, me, let me cut you off because I'm going to run out of time, Counselor. Let me ask you one more. In August 2021, we're not talking 20 years ago, we're talking 2021. You were involved in another report by the SPLC and you said that voter identification, photo ID to vote, is burdensome and does not serve any legitimate state interest. Do you really believe that? Senator, identification for voting is yes, something- Yes, but first, do you really believe that? You said it, you meant it? The Supreme Court in Crawford v. Marion County has already upheld voter ID laws as person- yep, Yeah, but you said it didn't serve any legitimate state interest. Do you believe that? Again, Senator, without that language in front of me, it's hard to understand you the said context. It. Here it is, August 2021. Well, there are I, cases. I'm just asking you to explain to me why having to prove you are who you say you are before you vote doesn't serve, you said it doesn't serve any legitimate state interest. I'm just asking you to explain that statement to me. I understand, Senator Kennedy, and again, without being able to see the language that appears before and after, it's hard for the context. You deny that you said it? I can't say that I, again, I haven't seen that language in front of me, but what I do know is that there have been voter ID cases in which courts have found yeah, but that I'm, it, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with the case law, but I'm asking what you think, because you may be on the 11th Circuit. Do you believe that voter ID it is, it, it, it is inappropriate? 
My commitment is to uphold the Supreme Court's decision in Crawford v. Marion I know, but County. here you said it was inappropriate. You deny that? Well, again, Shame. Senator, it would be it would be helpful to know if if that section of the report also cites to cases in which federal courts have found that certain voter ID laws do pose an burden on voters. Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks uh, to both of you uh, for coming to answer our questions today. Ms. Abudu, I'd like to start with you. Are you familiar with the concept of judge shopping? It sounds familiar to forum shopping. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of a, a, a close cousin of or a subset of, of foreign shopping. Um, sometimes it occurs within a particular judicial district or state where you're trying to get a judge that's more favorable uh, uh, to you. you. You've heard of that happening from time to time, regardless of, of the word described. It's not something that I would support. Right. And what's the reason why you wouldn't support it? because it undermines what should be a fair and impartial process where no matter which judge you appear before, you should feel that you will have a meaningful opportunity to be heard. Right. Yes, no, that, that's, that's well said. Uh, now you're the, uh, the director for strategic litigation uh, for the Southern Poverty Loss Strategy. That's your current position, is that right? Yes. Um, <clears throat> earlier this month, the Southern Poverty Law Center filed some litigation in the uh, U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Alabama, challenging uh, an Alabama statute called the Vulnerable Child Compassion and Protection Act. The name of that case was Ledinsky versus Ivy. It, about the same time, there were some other groups that filed very similar litigation in the middle district of Alabama, challenging the same law with uh, uh, virtually identical causes of action. That case was called Walker versus Marshall. Um, there were some motions that took place uh, that, that moved quickly. The plaintiffs in the Walker case moved to transfer the case to another judge within the middle district. That motion was denied, and that case was transferred up to the Northern District. And then after those cases were themselves consolidated and assigned uh, to a particular judge in the Northern District, both sets of plaintiffs uh, moved to dismiss the case without prejudice, announcing simultaneously that they would be refiling the case uh, probably within days. Um, in an unusual move, it's unusual for a, uh, a, a federal judge to call out parties in the process of dismissing a case pursuant to their motion. Um, but the district judge assigned to that case, Judge Lyles Burke in the U.S. Uh, district Court for the Northern District of Alabama, uh, called the parties out for, uh, for judge shopping. Uh, now, as the um, director for Strategic Litigation of the Southern Poverty Law Center. I assume you were involved in these cases. I'm not part of the litigation team for those cases, but yes, I am aware of those cases on our docket. Okay, so those are outside of your role within the Southern Poverty Law Center? As the director of strategic litigation, my responsibility is to oversee and provide general management for our cases, but it is the subject matter experts and the litigation team that handle the day-to-day, -day, including the filing of complaints, the briefing, and any oral arguments. Yeah. Um, now, do you agree with the Southern Poverty Law Center's position uh, in that case that gender-affirming care such as hormone therapy and sex reassignment surgery is quote-unquote medically necessary for minor children? Senator, what I can say is that as you've described the case, it is ongoing litigation, so I want to be and need to be very careful what I can say about the litigation in terms of its posture as well as in terms of the claims and potential evidence that will be introduced. Well, but wouldn't you have to recuse yourself if confirmed to this position from dealing with that case? 
Senator, my commitment is I will recuse myself from any case where I am on the papers, where I have played a role in bringing the litigation, and beyond that, I will adhere to the rules of judicial conduct that pertain to recusal. Would that cover your involvement in this case? I would want to study it very carefully, but again, it is something that I take when it comes to recusal very seriously so that litigants understand they are being heard by an impartial fair judge. Finally, uh, Ms. Abudu, uh, about a year and a half, close to two years ago, you gave a speech in which you, you insisted, quote, we continue to live in a separate and and unequal society, as evidenced by our neighborhoods, schools, jobs, and perhaps most horrifying, our, our prisons and jails. Our current criminal justice system is one of the most humane examples of how racial discrimination operates and can ruin people's lives forever, as we've seen in the cases of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and countless others. It's a criminal justice system that can literally kill you. When you add laws that prohibit people with a criminal conviction from voting, it's practically the same system as during slavery black people who have lost their freedom and cannot vote." Close quote. Is it the same? Uh, is it the same? Is, it, is that a fair comparison to compare individuals who have been convicted of a crime and, and imprisoned on the basis of that conviction? Is that the same as slavery? And is that not damaging to the... Uh, the the integrity of the court system? Is that an appropriate thing for someone uh, to be considered for a, a high respected lifetime position on the federal courts to, to, to say about the federal court system? Senator, those comments, which of course I don't have in front of me, but I will trust that it's a correct description, were made, of course, in my role as an advocate. And as I shared with the committee earlier, I understand the difference between being an advocate as opposed to being a judge, where, again, you must be fair and impartial. But as an advocate, of course, your responsibility is to zealously represent the interests of your clients. And I also appreciate your citation to the unfortunate deaths that occurred as part of the criminal justice system, which provide the context in which those comments were made. But just to be clear, I see my time's expired. This was not made in advocacy. This was not a legal brief. This was something you wrote in your name. Those were direct quotes that I read from you. Thank you.